Welcome to a psychiatrist's take on the Bible. This podcast does not provide psychiatric, medical, or professional advice, opinion, treatment, or counseling. It contains general information for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for psychiatric, medical, or professional care. It does offer a unique, so what, take on the Bible of a board-certified psychiatrist who is also an ordained minister. I entreat you, true yoke fellows, to do the work, to take the Word of God and all the powerful tools and principles and memorize at least the idea. So let me remind you of the tool that we're working our way through. Look at an issue. In this issue, the difference between a burden and an opportunity and challenge. We take opportunities and challenges and turn it into burdens. Looking at that reality, we first want to know what would the perfect, the ideal, look like. Then we must humbly look at what is it we do that messes it all up. I find it uncanny how human beings manage to choose exactly the wrong response. In fact, I've used it as another tool in my life. Figure out what I would naturally do then the righteousness is probably pretty much the opposite of that. And so we take things and mess them up. Well, what are the consequences? Until we look at that, we don't get properly motivated to humbly go through the process of reprogramming and allowing God to be sovereign as he works through us. And then lastly, practically, how can we better cooperate with God? So we're in the second step. How do we mess it up? I just love the devil's creativity. He's been around a long time, and the guy is pretty smart. What I don't love is how we buy into it. I do love the fact that he is a conquered being. Greater is he that is in us in the the world, so we don't have to mess up. But even as Christians, we tend to go our own way. And what do we do to take challenges and make them overwhelming? First, we wish there were no challenges at all. We try to ignore them, perhaps, and not see what's going on. I pastored a church in Chicago a while back, where, by God's grace, we added many troubled people to the fellowship. But the people who were there before kept saying, we didn't know there were so many problems in the world, by which they meant, we wish we didn't know there were so many problems in the world. Why can't you just let us play church in peace. And so we don't want to see. If we have to, we try our best not to care. It's not my problem. We blame others or make excuses and then bury ourselves in fantasy worlds, focusing on things that are neutral. Another thing we might do is we might decide that, yes, it is our responsibility to fix everything on our own. And we look at a problem and we do what we can and there's no other solution. And then the devil assures us that if we keep think, think, thinking and fussing over the details of the problem, it's unfairness, the danger, that somewhere in there we'll either find a solution or someone will fix it. Maybe the world or God or somebody will apologize. I think it's left over from when we were little babies. And we'd cry and scream and mom would fix it. But it doesn't work so hot when you're an adult. Just uses up all your thinking chemical, all your calming chemical, all your doing chemicals. And then you can't function. And you get trapped. Another way we manage to take challenges and blow them out of proportion is we make them bigger than they need to be. Anytime you reach out to influence someone else, to fix a problem, you need to start by thanking God that however this problem turns out, you're okay. But instead, we attach our worth to the outcome. 
and we handle things without asking others to come alongside because we don't want to be a burden and we don't want them to think we're weak and maybe take advantage. Anytime you handle something in your own strength without God and others, it's going to be much heavier. And God gives you no grace for coming at things in your own strength. Another thing, we find ourselves struggling with motivation. It's interesting, in Romans 6, Paul says, Why do I do what I know I shouldn't? And interestingly, I don't even want to. And why don't I get around to doing what I know I should and actually want to, but I don't do it? So, instead of going to God for motivation and and being grateful and and having others keep us accountable, what do we do? We try to motivate ourselves with negatives. We might call ourselves names. <laughs> when we were kids, our parents probably taught us that trick. You know, I told you a thousand times, why don't you clean your room? Here, let me do it. You're just going to mess it up. You'll never mount anything. We worry about the future and predict a dire outcome, thinking that'll get us going. We'll call ourselves names. We compare. The scriptures say, do not compare yourself with yourself. Just wonder what that means. Yeah, we compare with how we used to do, thinking we'll just snap out of our current difficulty. We compare with how we thought our life should go and think that will somehow just get us back on track. We compare with how other people seem to be doing. Of course, gives them, God gives them skills and grace for their role. They are different people. Shall the ear say, because I'm not an eye, therefore I'm not part of the body? How would we then hear? What if the whole body were a giant eyeball? No, we're, we're not supposed to be like others. At the same time, they're also showing us their best front. We can't see the other things that they can see. I always think that an average Christian is sitting in a room of 200 other Christians wondering why they themselves are so messed up and everybody else has their act together. Of course, that's not the case. I remember one patient, he went to a winter retreat with young adult singles. Everybody else was having fun, tobogganing and tubing and cooking some oars and singing songs. Finally, he couldn't take it anymore. He says, look, I'm glad you guys are so happy. I'm sitting here feeling worthless and suicidal and getting worse by the minute. I think I better go home. Two other people said, really? We feel that way too. And the rest said, wow, we didn't know. And it turned into the best winter retreat they ever had. But we tend to keep it to ourselves and compare. Another thing we do that takes our burdens and blows them out of proportion is to stuff. It works for a little bit. We ignore, we procrastinate, we push things down we don't want to look at. There is nothing that has ever happened to you. Nothing this world can deliver that God isn't bigger than that. And we need to look at it and call a spade a spade. We need to say, that was bad. That shouldn't have happened to anyone. It's part of this damaged, sin-filled world. And yes, I'm fighting the consequences of it. But I don't have to pretend it didn't happen. And now, let me see how I can grab a hold of the present by God's grace. Instead, we stuff our feelings. All of these things cause our brain to circle round and round, eating up our serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. God has designed our brain to take constant breaks. The two dominant neurotransmitters of your brain are glutamate and GABA. Glutamate gets the cortex to be alert, to think, to pay attention, to grab a hold of life with gusto. As soon as you've done what you can, you need to cast it on the Lord and and then You put out GABA, which calms everything back down. But instead, we put out glutamate all day long, and we burn out the responder nerves. And then we come up against a problem, and it's just overwhelming, because we just don't have the things to deal with it. And so what does that look like? Well, the consequence is that we can't handle our passion. We're too angry, too anxious too sad, 
too overwhelmed, too irritable. And when we realize it makes no sense, we can't turn it off. Or we can't ponder and organize and concentrate. We tune out the outside world and, and we start slowing down and making mistakes at work. We go out to the kitchen. We don't know what we're looking for. We get lost in a conversation. We uh, misplace things. We have free time and we plan to get a lot done and we get nothing done. Or <clears throat> we just find ourselves worrying and, and can't get back on track. I call it the vicious circle where people are so burned out they can't do the work to cooperate with God and, and others to quit being burned out. We get up in the morning and, and we force ourselves to do what we have to do. There's no joy in it. No sense of satisfaction. Everything is boring. And we look at doing the same thing tomorrow and the day after and it's a, oh Lord, you got to help me. Wow, how do I do it? Rather than being filled with joy and wonder at the privilege of doing the dishes, singing and making melody in our hearts, we put up with it because we're trying to be the good guys and we burn out. Well, if you can relate to any of this, you are suffering from the problem of being normal. And oh, the Lord is trying to get us to quit being normal, normal meaning what most people are like, and be healthy. So next time I'll talk about, well, okay, what are the cons well, what are the practical things in regards to responding properly? Okay, so we, we know that we should be resting in the Lord and we don't, and the consequences are damaging. So okay, what should we do? I'll cover that in the next blog. God bless you. Thank you.